Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, an offering to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas B. Miras, and this podcast is a production of CatholicCulture.org. Hey everybody, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Today I'm doing an episode that I've been looking forward to for a while, and on some of the previous episodes I've mentioned the book we'll be discussing today, The General Theory of Authority by Yves Simone. The topic has been relevant in previous episodes, and I'm glad that the topic of authority and the common good will finally be explored in full here. My guest today is a Dominican priest, Father Aquinas Gilbo. He's a professor of moral theology on the pontifical faculty of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C., and he is a senior editor at Elatea. Father Aquinas, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Thank you, Thomas. It's great to be with you. So I'll just say a few things about the author of this book before we get into the discussion of the subject matter. Yves Simone was a French Catholic political philosopher. He lived from 1903 to 1961. He was a student of my hero, Jacques Maritain. And like Maritain, he came to America to teach in the 30s. And like him, he taught at Notre Dame for a time and later at the end of his life at the University of Chicago. In exile, in the U.S. during World War II, he argued forcefully for the necessity that the French oppose fascism, and that earned him the nickname the Philosopher of the Fighting French. But now he's known best for his argument for the compatibility of Thomism with Western liberal democracy, as in his book The Philosophy of Democratic Government, and for his work on authority throughout his life as a philosopher. He came back to it in a number of books. Today we're discussing, as I said, The General Theory of Authority, a book which was published in 1962. And authority is a topic that is simply difficult for modern people. We tend to want to do away with it or explain it away in various ways, whether by the pretense, as I talked about in an earlier episode, that in democracy we are not ruled by anybody but ourselves, or as we'll talk about here, the attempt to replace authority with pure scientific governance and things like that. So, Father Aquinas, why don't you say a little bit about, because you're much more versed in political philosophy in general than I am, about the status that this work holds in that field? It is a remarkable little work. I mean, I'm holding the tome in my hand right now. It's not that long. But what Yves Simone is able to pack within the few pages of the work is rather remarkable. What he has produced, in fact, and this was published in the early 60s, what he's been able to produce is, to my mind, to others' minds, one of the best, if not the best, short Aristotelian Thomistic summary of a theory of authority, why we have authority, what authority is, and where does it come from? You know, what is the origin of authority? Ultimately, what Simone answers in this book is, what is the origin of our need? for authority. And as you just mentioned a moment ago, you know, our own modern political life is is shaped by a certain understanding of of authority, but also, and more importantly, I think this is what Simone saw, there's a certain understanding of the origin of authority. For us in kind of modern political times, we are convinced that somehow authority is is somehow unnatural (laughs) to the human person and is unnatural to society, that we need it in order to make up for some kind of deficiency, you know, either because of the weakness of human nature or propensity to sin. You know, we need some kind of authoritative figure in the world, in our lives, essentially to keep us from killing each other. You know, that's, it's, it's a very kind of negative view of human nature that's taken that if left to ourselves, you know, just the basis parts of us will manifest themselves and, and put us all at threat. So, in order to kind of secure a kind of peace among warring persons, authority is established in a kind of artificial way just to keep, you know, either the passions at bay or, or sin at bay to create some kind of modicum for, for peace so that, that people can be given the space, even in social spaces, to pursue their own individual goods. That's more or less 
you know, what we think today. And if we don't say that explicitly, it's what our kind of reigning political philosophy says about us and about the origins of society and about the origins of authority. We may not think all that much about it, but we do kind of live in, in that political myth. Simone is writing in the, the late 50s, early 60s to say, you know, that's not only not true, <laughs> but there's a very large part of human history that thought otherwise. And so going back to the ancients, Aristotle in particular, going back to the medievals, Aquinas in particular, Simone puts together, as the title of his book says, a general theory of authority, which draws on those ancient sources to show that, you know, it's not a deficiency that authority comes in to rectify, but rather it's because there's a good that peoples unite to pursue commonly. That's why we need authority. So authority comes out of not some deficiency on our part or some inclination of sin, but no, because we are made for the good. The good exists. The good exists outside of ourselves. The higher goods that, that are possible for us are those goods that are the result of common work and common effort and common action. And therefore, we need some principle to coordinate our action towards these common goods. And that's the origin and birth of authority. So that's what Simone is doing in this book. It's ultimately, it's, it's to, to call attention to the deficiency of our modern notions of authority, to remind us of better and more positive views of authority that we can draw from the ancient and medieval world and to launch that conversation and, and to help inspire us to see how it is that we can both appreciate the role of authority in our lives and perhaps reform then the way authority is exercised in our own day to recognize that it, it's not a, a necessary evil, but in fact, a real force for good. I have this experience with French Catholic writers of a certain era mm -hmm. where I just feel like I'm just imbibing wisdom <laughs> when I'm right. reading their books. You know, I've had it with, with Maritain, I've had it with Sertiange. Right. I felt like I was having it reading this book. And a part of the reason for that is I've talked about this a bit on the podcast before is, you know, after you know, a period where I thought I was a libertarian and then decided that I wasn't and then decided <laughs> that, you know, my one dalliance with ideology was going to be my only dalliance with ideology. And I just didn't think I was going to be satisfied with any ideology from thenceforth. I Instead of really like constructing a political worldview for myself, at least in philosophical terms, I sort of deconstructed a lot of modern assumptions and was just radically questioning a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And that really prepared me to receive what Simone was saying <laughs> in a very right tranquil way. It was, it was a wonderful experience. And it's, as you say, it's quite short and readable. And I didn't know anything about, I really didn't feel like I understood basically anything about this topic, about the justification mm -hmm. for authority. I just took it on, you know, the church's wisdom that there is such a thing. And same with the common good. You know, as a libertarian, I had to say as a Catholic that, sure, there's such a thing as the common good, but a part of me always thought, oh, that's just a weasel word, you know, but <laughs> after reading Simone, it's I'm slippery. like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I think I, I think I'm starting to get this. Right. So Simone launches the book with a little chapter on the things that have given authority a bad name. And right. in particular, he talks about genuine values, which modernity holds in high esteem, which authority might be seen to threaten. Maybe uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what it is that makes us suspicious, the legitimate reasons that w people are suspicious of authority? Right. I, you know, I think just to make one quick point, though, in, in commenting on what you said there about your transformation, personal transformation from kind of a libertarian way of looking at the world to a, a more Catholic one where you do th see things. I mean, Catholic social teaching is, is thick with discussion of the common good and, and authority. And, and if we're kind of shaped by more libertarian vision, all we can see in that kind of discussion are, are like leanings toward authoritarianism, right? You know, there, there's some unjust, some, you know, artificial imposition of one person's will on another. And that's the problem with authority, and therefore we should, you know, really reduce its expression, authority's expression, as much as we can in life. And I think when Simone goes through in that first chapter talking about what gives authority a bad name, it's just that, right? It's modern views of various values and goods that we see the exercise of authority threatening 
in some way. So he lists several, right? He says that in some ways we could see that authority comes into conflict with justice, you know, because we see that for in the market, for example, you know, just in order for just exchanges to take place, you need a real honesty and freedom between people. Like I, I show up in the market with the good that I want to sell. Let's say I make shoes. You know, people who need shoes come to me, and based on their need, we begin a conversation as to, you know, what was the cost for me in making these shoes? What are the value? You know, do the shoes have to the customer? And and you work out a just and an equitable price based on the price of providing a good, the value of receiving a good. You know, there are those who say that for the preservation of justice, you need kind of the absence of of what is taken to be authority in the marketplace. Something like price controls or or overregulation kind of ruins the exchange between a provider and a buyer. They can't have an honest conversation about their work and labor and and their need and desire. That if these decisions as to price and and how things are going to be exchanged are are determined by some outside authority, then, you know, there's some kind of imposition there. There's something unjust, you know, about the exercise of authority in that regard. There are others that Simone lists that in some ways authority can be seen to conflict with life in general. There's a way in which we privilege kind of spontaneous activity, which we see to be free activity that, that springs up and wells up from from the mysterious interiority of the human person, that the desire for our goods and the pursuit of our goods all comes from within, you know, the individual. And if somehow our activity is, is regulated by, by some external source or some external authority that would seem to impede the kind of the inner mysterious workings of our own spirit, well, then we would have, you know, a, a suspicion, you know, as to the goodwill or, or the desires of that of that external authority that if our action doesn't proceed from within somehow it's inauthentic if it's dictated from from without well then that's kind of an imposition on our own dignity a third category that simone lists that authority can seem to come into conflict is is truth itself that he sees that or at least we can see as moderns that somehow a system of authority especially in the sciences or in the realm of, of the quest for knowledge, that any type of expression of authority or imposition authority would undermine the free search for truth. I mean, campuses are embroiled in these kinds of discussions all the time. I mean, the whole debate over academic freedom and, and things like that, especially on Catholic campuses, you know, what does revelation <laughs> have to say to the human quest for truth? As moderns, we see those two things coming into conflict. It hasn't always been that way. But here we see how even God's own authority is seen to impede upon the honest human quest for truth. And some, you know, Simone gives these concerns their due. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. whole section later in the right. book where he talks about how, at least in the area of truth, authority is genuinely, you know, substitutional. Even in the case of divine revelation, it's a substitute right. for actually seeing it for yourself. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's not necessary and it's not something that everybody needs to submit to, you know, in this life. Right. Right. And at the heart of it, what Simone is saying here is that there's just kind of a prejudice in terms of truth and knowledge against authority, that the authority is, is necessary simply for those who are ignorant. You know, that, that the more we increase our knowledge, the less we need authority to govern our action or, or to determine our action. The less knowledgeable we are, well, then we, you know, we do kind of rely on others. I guess you could kind of see this in the family, right? I mean, that parents ex exercise a lot of authority over their children in large part because because of their own lack of knowledge about things which is is growing it's developing as as the child grows but you know we don't we don't leave a 3 year old to kind of determine the family diet you know there's a there's a lot of authority that parents express and exercise over the dinner table for example and that's a good thing but then we see that, you know, as the child grows up and, and gets wiser and can make these good decisions for himself, the need for, for parental authority fades. And that is then extrapolated to something wider like society as a whole, that the more knowledgeable a society becomes, the less it needs, you know, at least expressions of parental authority. And, and lastly, one last conflict that Simone recognizes and considers is that authority can seem to conflict with order itself. 
that there is something of a romantic rebellion that still governs our culture, that any kind of imposition of order upon kind of generosity, spontaneity, passion is seen as, as illegitimate, an unjust imposition on those real sources of, of energy and drive that should govern life. That's an artificial you know, imposition on that. So you see this really burgeoning in the romantic movement of the 19th century, you know, flowing into the, the 20th century. There's also what Simone says is a rebellion, even by those who, who desire order and appreciate order, they detest what they seem to perceive as a, as a kind of forced order, an imposition of order that's more concrete than, let's say, law itself would establish. There is something about law that we create laws that are somewhat abstract. You know, we don't include every concrete detail of a, of a given action in the way we we make law. We make law that's somewhat abstract and open to interpretation. But if a law is written in such a way as as to determine very concrete actions, we can see that as an improper imposition of law. So there are these ways, again, against justice, life, truth, order, ways in which authority perhaps in history has been exercised to give some offense to these realities. That's all culminated in our own day, I think, magnified by our own modern sensibilities to kind of give you know, authority a kind of side glance. You know, we treat it with, with some suspicion. As you've already mentioned in your sort of opening comments, the big question in the book is whether authority is necessary only to address deficiencies or is it a result of what is actually good in human nature? Is it actually a positive thing in itself? Mm -hmm. So this takes us to the topic of the common good. And what are these social goods? He asks about, he talks about why it is that individuals need a society. And mm -hmm. the typical kind of economistic way of thinking about it is that they need society to satisfy their material needs, essentially. And modernity sees the sort of highest goods, the intellectual and the spiritual goods, as being really the province of the individual and something mm -hmm. that is not held in common as much. Why is this mistaken? Yeah, it's a very myopic view of what the human good is. You know, when we talk about the common good, I mean, one of the real challenges that we have, and I think man has experienced this in every age, but it's especially challenging in our age, is to identify just what the common good is. <laughs> you know, what, what are we talking about when we, you know, use that phrase? What are we identifying with the phrase common good? What does that term point to? For a lot of people, it's, it's just a very slippery term. Even Aquinas, when treating it, recognized that we use the word, the term common good in so many different ways to talk about so many different things. And Aquinas is patient with that. He says, you know, it's not wrong that there are multiple ways in which we can use the adjective common in applying that to the, the noun good. But we should take some time to reflect on what that term actually means and what's the primary thing that uh, the primary good that the term common good points to. So someone I, I focus my own research on is Charles de Koenig, who is like Simone, a Francophone European philosopher living in North America, you know, during the, the Second World War. De Koenig, though, immigrated much earlier and spent his whole teaching career in Quebec. But he wrote a tremendous little essay in 1943 called The Primacy of the Common Good. And what he does in that little work is provide perhaps the best, certainly best contemporary commentary on St. Thomas's doctrine of the common good that we have. And so I wrote my own, my own dissertation as a, as a kind of commentary on De Conic's commentary of Aquinas. And what De Conic does in that short work is, is model for us, you know, the kind of conversation we need to have in order to use the, commenter, the term common good wisely and accurately. So there are a couple steps that, that he shows. First, in, in trying to identify what the common good is, we really need to understand what the common good is in distinction from the particular good. So insofar as you know, we all desire the good, insofar as we desire our own perfection, you know, certain goods that we find in nature that promote our own flourishing, a lot of those goods are what we call particular goods, that they're goods that we acquire, we consume, they keep us alive, you know, they, they promote our general well-being 
But in using those goods, they benefit only me, you know. So, you know, my hamburger is my hamburger. My sweater is my sweater. My office is my office. You know, insofar as those things are goods for me, they're not goods for someone else. In order for me to benefit from their good, I have to consume that good in such a way that someone else, you know, can't. And that's not an injustice. That's just the nature of the good itself. You know, two people can't occupy the same sweater at one time. You know, two people can't eat the same banana at the same time. It's just the nature of those goods to be particular, to extend their goodness to one beneficiary, to one person. So a good that's particular to one person is therefore alien, you know, to another. Those aren't the only kinds of goods, though, that exist in the world. Those aren't the only kinds of goods that contribute to our goodness and, and well-being. There's also what we call common goods. And this is, in distinction from a particular good, a good that is itself singular. It's one, but it can be the good of many people at one time. And there's a way in which we call those goods, you know, common goods. Now, already, though, we need to make another distinction because there's some goods that we call common, which are nothing more than really a collection of particular goods. And there are other goods that we call common that are really common in themselves, which is to say they can be enjoyed by many at one time without themselves being divided. Let me give some examples of that. So, I mean, for example, let's say, you know, it's your birthday and, and your family provides you a big chocolate cake. There's a way in which that chocolate cake is a common good of the whole party. But what kind of good is that? Is that a good that we just call common because many people share in it? Or is it really common in itself? I would say it's the former because how is it that the party then enjoys the chocolate cake? It's not the chocolate cake as a whole. Somebody has to take a knife and start cutting the thing up into individual pieces. So in order for that common good of the cake to be enjoyed, it has to be divided, you know, and has to be divided in such a way that the whole no longer exists. Everybody gets just a piece of the cake, and it's the piece of the cake that they enjoy and that benefits them. So there's a sort of way in which, even though we call the cake a common good, it's really, at least potentially, nothing more than a collection of particular goods. You know, it only can benefit people when it's cut up, divided, and everybody gets a little piece or part of the good. You can look at a pension fund in the same way. You can look at a city's water reservoir in the same way. You know, we can look at those as common goods because they benefit many people. But how do they benefit people? Well, by being cut up and divided. The whole disappears as it disintegrates into its individual parts, which are then enjoyed by many people. He contrasts a business partnership of a certain kind where right. the two are going their separate ways with the goods they have each attained from it with a contract of another kind like marriage. Exactly. And then so marriage, and that's, that's what I was about to get to, is just in, in contrasting that kind of common good with what you might call an authentic common good. These are goods that, again, are singular, they're numerically one, but they benefit many people at once without itself being divided. And these are, are rather remarkable. <laughs> because they're transcendent, we say. These goods have the ability of sharing their goodness with many people at once, again, without being divided. The whole remains a whole, the good remains whole, and it encompasses, you know, it benefits many people at one time. And what are these? Well, these are, are social goods. So the good of the family, the good of the city, the good of the church, the good of beatitude, the good of heaven. These are all social goods in which the good of the whole is good, is the good of all of its parts all at once without the whole being divided. In fact, the parts contribute to, they make up, you know, integral parts of, of the whole and, and enjoy the good of the whole as such. So, for example, just think about your family. I mean, you know, the family is made up of many members. It has its good. You know, there's the good of the, the smiths which is also all at once the good of Mr. Smith, Mrs. Smith's, and all of the, the little Smith's that they have. You can't say that, you know, there's just kind of one part of the good of the Smith family that belongs to the father, one part of the good of the Smith family that belongs to the mother, another part that belongs, you know, to the children. Each and every part of the whole, each and every part of the family enjoys the whole good insofar as they're a part of the whole. And so when you start to look at the, the metaphysics of, of, of these goods, you realize how remarkable they are. 
that within nature, you know, we have these, these goods that transcend individuality, that encompass as many individuals at once without themselves being divided. When you compare that to a particular good or just a collection of particular goods, you really see how unique and how special, how noble these real common goods are, the good of the, the family, the good of the city, the good of the church, the good of the universe, the good of, of beatitude, the good of heaven. So, it kind of helps us, you know, to, to make a lot, a lot of these important distinctions in order to identify precisely what we're talking about when we say that the common good takes a certain priority over the, over the particular good, how our pursuit of the particular good should be oriented to our enjoyment of the common good. That's just to say that, you know, I as a member of my family, I as a citizen of my city, and I as I pursue all of the goods that keep me alive and promote my individual well-being, I do that. I pursue those goods. I enjoy those goods within the context of also pursuing the good of my family and also pursuing the good of my political community. The moment I turn away from the family or turn away from the city, to pursue my own particular good is not only a manifestation of a kind of selfishness, but it, it betrays our, our social and political nature, and it deprives us of, in fact, the goods that are greater than our own particular goods, which are these social goods, the good of the family and the good of the city. Yves Simone also talks about this in terms of the perfection of human nature, and I'd like to read mm -hmm. a quote from him, which I really liked. He says, the masterpiece of the natural world cannot be found in the transient individual, nor can it be mm -hmm. found in the species, which is not imperishable except in the state of universality, but in that state it is no longer unequivocally real. Human communities are the highest attainments of nature, for they are virtually mm -hmm. unlimited with regard to diversity of perfections and virtually mm -hmm. immortal. Right. So there's that point about the, the diversity of perfections. It's very interesting, and it, it especially in a time of you know extreme specialization, you know that really sure. hits home. No, and it, it's uh, what he's talking about there is just what the ancients and the medievals would have seen in, in comparing, let's say, the common good to our particular goods. I mean, yeah, that there's certain things that we enjoy within the family that we could never produce on our own. You know, which is to say. The good of, as Aquinas would, would say, the good of the hearth, you know, <laughs> the good of the common table, that life within the family is shared in such a way that I share life with others and that I enjoy goods with others that just wouldn't benefit me in the same way if I enjoyed them simply by myself. So not only does the family give me the opportunity to enjoy certain goods that I could never attain on my own, but even those goods that I could attain on my own, the way I enjoy them in the family with others kind of redounds to my well-being, you know, in a way that I wouldn't enjoy if I was just enjoying those goods alone. For Aquinas, this is quite natural. This was a manifestation, expression of our, our social and political nature. So, that, that gets to Simone's point there, that there's a diversity in, of perfections that the family offers that our own particular goods don't. And you can extend that up to the common good of the city, that there are certain goods that the city affords us that are the result of our living together as citizens within a political community that even the family, you know, is incapable of providing itself. So, there's a certain way in which the common good of the family is oriented to the higher common good of the city, that families, in a sense, live together within the political community to enjoy the goods and protections that only a political community can provide. So, there's a diversity of perfection in the family and even greater diversity of perfection in the city. And these are our better goods. These are, are better than our particular goods. We enjoy our particular goods in these higher, higher goods. And again, it's a testimony to, to ancient medieval philosophy in recognizing this, that we're just kind of humble enough to sit back and look at reality and, and marvel at this, these social goods that emerge which you know, the modern turn to the individual and the growth of individualism has, has somewhat blinded us to. We're kind of talking about it on an ontological level, I suppose. But mm -hmm. Yves Simone, one of, the, one of the things that he talks about is the necessity of having unity of common action. So once you've established right. there's such a thing as a common good, obviously action needs to be coordinated in various ways. Right. But why would it need to be done so by an authority? Because, of course, it's important to emphasize that he wants to know whether in a society, perhaps a small one, of 
composed completely of virtuous and intelligent individuals, there would be any necessity for authority in the sense that if it's possible to determine the best common action by reason alone, then a society of intelligent and virtuous individuals could, you know, seemingly come to that spontaneously. And that is true. But he wants to emphasize that there are questions in which there is no abstractly determinable best answer. Right, right. I mean, he makes a beautiful point there because he's really, he really knocks, you know, the enlightenment down a notch or two, (laughs) which is to say, he takes kind of the overconfidence that we have in reason, which is to say, not really an overconfidence in reason, but a certain conception of reason, that if reason operates rightly, it only is going to arrive at kind of a singular truth. So that if you have three people who have optimal functioning reason, according to the ideals of the Enlightenment, they're all going to come to the same conclusion about things in any kind of realm of thinking. Because, again, because that, that's just kind of how they, they prejudge what, what reason can do. Simone says, no, that's actually not the case. That the increase of knowledge and kind of the higher functionings of our reason contribute to not just kind of one understanding of things, but rather a way of seeing things in all of their complexity, in all of their richness. So, which is to say that, you know, a society of persons who come together to achieve a goal, the increase in the knowledge of their goal doesn't mean that they're all going to spontaneously conclude that there's only one real rational way to get to the end. Under concrete and contingent circumstances. Yeah, in their own day, in their own time, in their own place, you know, that they're all going to come to the same same conclusion about that. No, I mean, Simone says, no, I mean, the more you know about the the end or the more society comes to appreciate its end, the more that the society is going to recognize that there is a whole variety of ways to achieve their goal. There are a whole variety of ways in which they can come together and work together to achieve the goal. And therefore, yeah, you're not going to get kind of common united action to arise spontaneously, you're going to just get a whole bunch of people who see that there are 10,000 ways to get to the end. And among good people and smart people, they might disagree as to what prudently is, is the best course of action. And that's where Simone says the need for authority arises out of an abundance of, of the good and an abundance of knowledge about the good. If a people or a society are going to come together and engage in common action, to achieve the common end, there has to be one practical course that's set out for them, that among the, the many ways to achieve the end, one has to be settled upon and set as the course of action as the whole. And for Simone, that's the, that's the essential kind of work of authority. It's to coordinate common activity of a community towards its common end in the very concrete and material ways and means uh, to achieve the end. So it's not really, authority doesn't set the end so much as it sets the means for a community for achieving the end. Just to sort of restate what you've said there, the idea Simone is referring to is that essentially there is never a situation where there are several equally good options to choose between, that that's simply an illusion of ignorance. And just as in the realm of science, sort of theoretical science, there is only ever one right answer and any kind of indifference between multiple answers Mm -hmm. is a result of ignorance and kind of a partial measure. Mm -hmm. If you had enough scientific knowledge, at least in theory, one best way would always prevail. And, And there's a great line where he says, this belief expresses aversion to the mystery involved in free choice, as well as to the darkness of contingency. And one example he gives of an area where contingency is at play in the decisions of authority is the existence of of borders, of a city, of a state, of a country. And it, of course, it's mm-hmm. those are not just due to the acts of authority, obviously, but it's a particularly relevant answer today because there's a sense, and, I, and again, I had this in my earlier days, that I thought, well, anything that is not sort of rationally determinable is arbitrary. And if it's arbitrary, then it's meaningless. So I, I kind of thought, and I think a lot of the sort of mm-hmm. people who are in favor of the eradication of borders think this way, that that it's essentially meaningless because it's contingent, because nobody can really ultimately give a complete rational exp- right. explanation for why 
you know, these two communities are separate <laughs> rather than part of one larger community. Right. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, it's to show that even though that's steeped, like where borders lie, it's steeped in contingency, it's to, it's our job to show that that's not arbitrary. <laughs> you know, for example, I'm in Washington, D.C. Right next to us is Arlington, Virginia. And there's a big old river <laughs> that runs between the two, which serves as a kind of natural boundary between these two groupings of people, which is to say that, you know, the common good of Washington, D.C. is not the common good of Arlington, Virginia. We have two different names for those things because they constitute two different political communities. Sometimes the persons might overlap. They live in Arlington, they work in D.C., and vice versa. But insofar as what the common good of Washington, D.C. is, that's not communicable to, to Arlington, Virginia. They have their own common good. And it makes sense that somewhere, physically, <laughs> you, would, you would draw a line, just in terms of where the extension of the authority of one political community would end and another would begin. Perhaps we do this more arbitrarily when there's no natural boundaries, like a river or a mountain range or something like that, right. or a lake between two communities. I'm thinking of Chicago and, and its surrounding suburbs where it's just, you know, right. it's a street. <laughs> on one side, you're in, in Chicago, you know, on the other side, you're in, you know, Aurora. And if those two touch, I don't know. My Illinois geography may be <laughs> lacking here, but you know what I mean. You know, there are it's a real reflection on the good here and to recognize that the common good of the United States of America is not the common good of Mexico. Those are two distinct political communities, two distinct common goods there. And it's not, it may be conventional, but it's not arbitrary or meaningless that we right. would draw a border between those two as a way of regulating how life between those two political communities can, can be shared in some way. And Simone wants to emphasize that even in cases where there is no easy like thing you can point to, like a river making up the borderline, these things are based in, you know, to some extent in the accident of history, but mm -hmm. almost because of that, they're embedded in human identity and, and the richness of human life in a way right. that you can't simply sweep away with a perfectly rational administration. Right. No, that's right. And that's kind of the wonderful thing, again, about these common goods. Aquinas makes an observation here, and it's been kind of expounded on by others, is that even though these, these goods are rooted in nature, you know, the good of the family, the good of the city, there is a way in which they're kind of man-made creations, right? I mean, you know, your family, my family just didn't fall out of the sky, <laughs> you know, boy met girl, boy fell in love with girl, you know, boy proposes to girl, they get married and have a family you know, for the United States, you know, is the coming together of 13, you know, independent English colonies to form a federal republic. And then all of a sudden you have the United States of America. So there is something that's conventional about these common goods. They come into existence through the consent of the original parties. There is a sense in which they never had to exist, you know, but once they do come into existence, once like our parents, you know, came together, got married and and gave their consent to each other to intermarriage as a husband and wife. You know, history's changed at that point, you know, forever, or in an everlasting sense, that their family will always in some way exist, because it will, it will always have been similar for something like the United States. It never had to exist, but, but once it came into existence, you know, history has changed forever. The United States will always have been because of the emergence of that political community with its own kind of expression of, a unique expression of political authority. So again, it's just to kind of sit and wonder over these things, kind of, that it really does help us to overcome our modern enlightened prejudices about kind of the eternal kind of fixity of things and the eternal fixity of reason. There are, you know, infallible truths that we can discover and know and have to confess. But at the same time, it's not all of life that functions in the same way as infallible truth. There's a lot of contingency. There's a lot of potency, <laughs> as Aquinas and Aristotle would say, in life that depending on how and when it's actualized, yeah, that can be contingent. And the better part of prudence then is to govern, you know, and Simone will say that too. It's the better part of authority is to kind of organize and govern the contingencies of life. And for Simone, that's just another reason for the need 
for authority. It's not to impose scientific rationalism on society, but rather, no, to, to be quite caught up in the ebb and flow of history, the ebb and flow of contingency, and organize you know, common activity of a community towards its end in the ebb and flow of time and change. So going back to the idea of the necessity for the unity of common action, authority mm -hmm. serving this function, particularly in questions where there's no abstract best answer. Now, without getting into the the weeds of a theory of knowledge, different types mm -hmm. of knowledge, we do need to explain how then does the authority determine what decisions to make, if not purely by reason. Right. Well, Simone does kind of... Kind of come close to saying sometimes it's just luck, but it's obviously just more than that. It's how is it that an authority, you know, comes into being? I mean, Aquinas, you know, talks about this a little bit that either, you know, a community can come together itself and make all of its decisions, its common decisions communally. So you can have something like a direct democracy, which might work in a group of 10 people. It doesn't work well in a group of 100,000 people. And so you have more representative forms of government emerge where people come together and choose from among themselves what Aquinas calls like a vicar for the community who is given kind of a concentration of the exercise of the authority enjoyed by the whole community so that decisions can be made efficiently, prudently, you know, for, for the whole. And so I think that's what, what we do when we elect leaders, right? It, it's what we do when a community chooses for itself someone to exercise authority over them, what you're asking them to do is, given our common end and given the fact that our activity needs to be coordinated to that end, someone needs to be an authority to exercise their prudence to determine, you know, the, the common means, you know, for us. And we judge those people according to how well they exercise their prudence, you know. When you talk about prudence, then mm -hmm. we are getting into concrete circumstances right. where there's no sort of definite abstract rule. So that's that's what I was sort of trying to get at is that right. there is a kind of knowledge by inclination and a rule of action that's more of a virtue than an abstract set of principles. Absolutely. No, and that's the work of prudence, right? For each of us. I mean, every act that we perform <laughs> throughout the day and every day is somehow the result of prudence where we fix on an end, we fix on a goal, and then the very next thing we do is start to deliberate as to how to achieve that goal because there are many means that appear to us. Some are immoral and we rule those out. Among the moral ones, the good ones, some might just be in, inappropriate to, to time and place, you know, and so we rule those out. So in the ones that we have left, we make a judgment about as to, okay, what is the best means here and now for me to achieve the goal that I've, I've set for myself? And insofar as we do that a thousand and one times a day in everything that we do, communities function according to the same kind of virtuous process, the virtuous discernment and judgment and, and command of action. The one in authority. There is sort you know, of an intuition does that involved. For the whole. There is. Well, I wouldn't put too much emphasis on intuition, though, because what Aquinas would say, it's not so much intuition, but judgment that we make that's based on you know, our investigation of the means, our understanding of the moral quality of the means, our looking forward to the circum to the consequences of, of a proposed action, also investigating the, the proposed action to see if there are any hidden dangers there. We can kind of develop a sense for that as we, you know, perform certain actions over and over again. So in that way, insofar as prudence might go quickly, you can say that maybe there's a kind of intuition there. But, but what's, I think, at the heart for Aquinas, it's, it's a judgment that's made that among kind of equally good and equally appropriate means to an end, we have to make a judgment of, as to the best one. And sometimes that might be wrong. You know, we can make errors in our, in our judgments, but it, it's really, it's a real rational act. We're not always kind of shooting from the hip or just acting from the gut. For, for, what, for Aquinas, the prudence is is first and foremost uh, kind of the intellectual deliberating and judging and electing, choosing our action in the midst of kind of, yeah, comparing kind of objective ideal to what our circumstances require. But as we've said, of course, the more you know, the more your legitimate and 
even equally good options may increase rather than than decrease. And so authority still serves that vital function of picking the common action. Does authority have a role to play in determining the common good itself as well as the means which you've just discussed to achieving it? Yeah, sure. Because Simone makes that point insofar as, I mean, there is a sense in which because of its common action, let's say a family kind of becomes more itself, the more it cooperates, the more it follows the direction of, let's say, the head of the household or the parents of a family. You know, cities can do the same thing, right? You know, once, let's say, you know, Denver, Colorado was founded, you know, in the middle of <laughs> of nowhere as some kind of little, you know, pioneer stop, you know, Denver is in a sense more itself now than it was then because of the authority that was exercised there in terms of coordinating the common activity of a community that has led to its its flourishing and its and its growth. You can say that really about every every city. So so there is a sense in which authority can help direct the common activity of a people, not just in terms of determining the means to the end, but authority is is really there also as a kind of teacher and promoter of the end. And we see that in all kinds of ways. I mean, just think of the Veterans Day parades that took place earlier this week. Those, you know, are mostly organized by cities and towns. And it's a way for the civic authority to say that it's good for a local community to give thanks to those who who risk their own lives for the preservation and the security of of the homeland or the city. You know, we like to see governors and presidents and elected officials get up on on the 4th of July to talk about the foundation of a nation, the goodness of a nation, the prosperity of a nation, and also to talk about what virtues are necessary in citizens to promote the advance of the nation as a real good in itself. So yeah, so there is a sense in which authority doesn't just coordinate activity, but also points to and promotes the virtue of the end of of the common good itself as something to be loved in itself. Simone uses that example, I think maybe in a later chapter of those kinds of occasions, the raising of a flag, the giving of a speech by a public person Mm -hmm. as instances where the common good is manifested in those very occasions in the sense of people of having a common purpose, a common spirit. And that those the, the common good is particularly, I suppose you could say, luminous mm-hmm. in those moments. Right. I would like to ask you about something you mentioned earlier. You were talking about how you know a private person, a, a father of a family, a business owner, cannot turn away from the common good. There's a self interest in that, and yet right. Simone talks about you know the sort of what you could call the the private and public capacities of a person, or or the common right. in particular. He uses a number of different terms because one of the one of the points he's making is that the authority does not have to be separate from the people as as a whole but there is practical reasons why that tends to happen and it has to do with the making a distinction between the form and the matter of a common right. good he says that everybody has to will the form of the common good even a private person but that mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean knowing you know the concrete manifestation that that it will have right so am i right in understanding what he's saying that it is the job of authority to attend to the matter of the common good right yeah so i mean we can give concrete examples of that right so let's say here in washington dc as a citizen i you know insofar as the we've determined it in most places the united states that cities and localities, let's say, oversee the education of children. We see that as part of the common good, that the citizenry be educated to be good citizens, and therefore we come together and support that collectively. As a citizen, what am I responsible for? Well, to live in such a way and to support the good of the city in such a way is that it it provides for the education of children. So I'm supporting there as a private citizen, as a citizen of the city, the, the form of the common good there insofar as it, it promotes the, the education of children. That's going to be different from the mayor, who is not only in support of the promotion of education of the citizens of Washington, D.C., but 
has to make concrete decisions as to how that's going to take place. <laughs> you know, how many schools do we need to build? Where do we build them? How much money do we spend per year per school? How much money do we spend per year per student? How many teachers do we need to supply? You know, for any number of students. I as a private citizen might have opinions about those things, and so far as maybe I I study kind of the logistics of education, but it's not my purpose as a private citizen to supply those kinds of decisions that provide for the very matter of the common good. That's what the public authority does. That's what the mayor does. That's what the, the superintendent of schools does. Like a private citizen, they, they support the form of the common good, but they're also involved in making very concrete decisions that determine the matter of the common good in that sense. So that, you know, based on the decisions of, of elected officials, you know, the matter of the common good in terms of education might look one way here in D.C. It's going to look a different way, you know, across the river in Arlington, Virginia, because the decisions made by the public authority there for that community might not be the same as the ones for D.C. because the circumstances are different. The needs of the citizenry may be different. And therefore, the matter of the common good is going to look different in those two cities, even though the form of the two is the same. And you can multiply examples like that. Another way of looking at it is that we understand that it's the responsibility of the father of a family to tend most of the time to the particular good of his own family in in, mm-hmm. in preference to that of other families, that, although he wills that, you know, in, in form as part of the common good. But when he goes to vote on a matter, you know, it I think it is considered wrong if he in that instance were to vote you know, primarily based on how it would affect his own family. That is an important point to make because what he's functioning there as is not only a member, of, not only an individual qua himself, so he's not voting his own particular self-interest. He's also there not simply as the head of a household or, you know, the husband of a couple or of a family. He's in the voting booth qua citizen, qua member of that political community. And therefore, to pull the lever, you know, in, in making a prudential decision, in voting one way or another on a particular issue, he has to have the end of, of the city in view. You know, he, he should be making a judgment as to what's good, not just for me or for my family, what's, what's good for the whole here. And in particular instances, that may be, that might require some, what's best for the city may require some sacrifice for my family, maybe even some painful sacrifice. But insofar as it's good for the whole, as a part of the whole, it's, it's my, my duty as a citizen to promote and, and support that. You know, Aquinas had a certain view on this. You know, he, he said that, you know, the common good of, of the political community has to be loved for itself. It can't be loved for the particular good of, of any individual person. Also, I mean, much less the king or the, the mayor, you know, can't love the good of the city simply for himself. He says, ultimately, that's, that's the definition of a tyrant. The tyrant is one who loves the common good, not for itself, but for himself. And it's not only the one in political authority who can fall to that temptation, it's any citizen. Anyone can, can fall to the temptation of the tyrant, which is to say, t- to love the city not for itself and the good that it provides for all, but for myself. And I love the city just for the good that it, it provides me. For Aquinas, that's just a sinful way of living as a citizen. It's a sinful way of loving the city. And uh, that's a challenge to us because I think when most of us go into the fo- voting booth, yeah, we, we go in there, we, we have our own self-interest in mind, we pull the lever in that regard, and we just have our fingers crossed that 51% of the people also voting that day have the same self-interest, <laughs> you know, and somehow it all works out that way. But no, the real challenge is, is to love the city for itself and the good that it extends to all, and to love the good of the city in its very shareability with fellow citizens and therefore what I do to promote the well-being of the city is is to ensure that it's loved and, and enjoyed by all. So that can be a challenge for us in terms of how we approach the political common good, the public square and and the voting booth. Simone gets into a fairly technical discussion of different types of particularity of functions. So say in a government or an organization there are a number of a number of functions you know, that there's different ministers, different departments, things mm-hmm. like that. But as functions, they don't sort of have autonomy in themselves. Right. They they may, for various practical reasons, 
but simply as functions of a of a common aim there's no real reason for them to be autonomous but then he talks about the particularity of subjects and it's the particularity of the subject rather than the function that may be carried out by a subject that serves as a principle of autonomy and therefore a limit on authority. So maybe, you know, right. this is probably the most technical part of the the book actually, but maybe you could explain a little bit the nature of the subject and and why it does carry with it a principle of autonomy. Yeah, so it's because ultimately as as Aquinas would recognize, I mean what lies at the heart of human dignity is that we are the governors of our own action. When you look at the rest of the animal world, you see that even though we can recognize that the animals move by sense, you know, they have sense perception, there's some kind of reason, you know, because they, they put image and memory together, they put image and passion and desire together in a certain way. You know, the dog sees the squirrel and chases it, you know, the cat sees the mouse and kills it, you know, <laughs> they're able to do these kind of logical, reasonable activities. But what we recognize is that there's no reasoning of the cat that's intelligent. There's no reasoning of the dog that's intelligent. They're not thinking about or theorizing about chasing the squirrel, chasing the mouse. They're not sitting back making prudential decisions about these things. They acted according to instinct. You know, that the way of putting means to ends in most of the animal kingdom is by instinct. Where for us, it comes through intelligent deliberation, intelligent judgment intelligent choice. We don't just act by instinct. We act through discursive reasoning and election and command. And for Aquinas says, says that's, that's at the heart of, of human dignity. It's what makes each individual responsible for his own activity. And it makes him yeah responsible for his actions such that he can either merit reward for what he does or merit punishment. Merit reward for the good that he does, merit punishment for the evil that he does. And so, in persons, there's just something about this kind of sovereignty of the individual in a, in a certain way, insofar as everyone is supposed to be self-governing in their action, through their own deliberation, judgment, choice, and command, that, that we don't make decisions for each other. I mean, the ideal is for each to make the prudential decisions for himself. No one can impose their prudence you know, on another. No one can impose their, their conscience on another in that way. So that among, you know, let's say functionaries within a government or even voters in, in the booth, they can't be commanded in, in a certain way at a certain level as to what it is that they do. They, they do have to operate according to their own lights. And so there, there is a limit to authority, you know, in that sense, which we recognize to a certain extent that even within the American federal system, we recognize that there are limits to what it is that government can command. And so we have a long history of respecting the conscientious objector. You know, that even though authority determines that defense against this enemy is crucial and, and has to be exercised right now because of the risk involved and the potential loss even of not just of property, but even of life, that one can conscientiously object to, to being called to serve because of yeah, they just don't see how it is that the decision made by the authority in that instance is, is, is right and just. And therefore, we, we have room in our political process, the room, room in our exercise of authority to, to make accommodation there. You know, a lot of people, a lot of believers in our own day are, are seeking, you know, conscientious objections to all kinds of things in the workplace, in the medical field, especially, you know, that, that Christian doctors, Christian nurses not be forced by the authority of the hospital or whatever to, to perform certain illicit and sinful actions. So, so yeah, Simone sees that. And I think the wider tradition would see that there, because of the sovereignty of the individual, kind of the mysterious nature of, of every individual interiority, that there's, there's something that has to be respected about the decision-making of each person, that the citizen in the city is not just a robot who are just subject to the commands of authority. Aquinas understood this in terms of law itself, that law is, uh, we understand it today, just to be an expression of the will of the authority imposed on the will of the subject or citizen. Aquinas had a completely different view of law. What he saw law as is that it's, it's the expression of the intelligence of the authority 
you know, given to the citizen for his or her own enlightenment. It's, so it's, it's a communication from intelligence to intelligence to inform the citizen as to, you know, the, the prudential living of their life, you know, within the city. That's a very different view. And I think that that better highlights what, what, what Simone is trying to say in terms of the limits of authority, because it's not just in position of will upon will. It should be the, the expression of kind of a rational understanding of the common good shared with the citizen so that that can then inform his, in an authoritative way, to inform his prudence, you know, just in his life in the family and, and his life in the city. He talks later about how the way that, you know, the particular subject cleaves to the matter as well as the form of the common good is by obeying the authority. And in that sense, he kind of assimilates right. to himself these higher perfections, especially when, when the authority is itself an excellent authority, right. that, that the subjects can actually grow in, in excellence. But it seems that what you were saying about the interiority of the subject requiring some kind of autonomy, it goes back to that potential objection of authority as being in conflict with life. So so here we, right. we see an area where authority does have to be limited, and that may be especially the case with regard to those things that are deepest in the human person, you know, n not so much the things of our animal nature, but certainly our spiritual impulses. Right. And from that, we're going to wrap up pretty soon, I think. But mm -hmm. from that, I think it would be good to continue on to the idea of the individual versus the person right and how the way that we see particular subjects in relation to a community shifts depending on whether we think of them as individuals or persons that was one of the more surprising things i mean i've read you know simone's book years ago and but then in preparing for our conversation today you know reviewed it a good bit and and that section jumped out at me again because it does have a long history and it does involve people like Merita and De Koenig and others. You know, throughout the 20s, 30s, and 40s, as, you know, all of Catholic Europe is dealing with the emergence of totalitarian regimes there, you know, the whole personalist movement arises as a way of, of contending with totalitarianism. And one of the ways they try to rescue the dignity of the human person from totalitarian oppression was, you know, making this distinction between the human creature as an individual and the human creature as a spiritual person. And I think getting into details that would take us too far afield, but, but there was a lot of discussion and a lot of debate over this. Deconic was one who, who didn't like that distinction, who thought it muddied the waters a bit too much. And as a disciple of Merita, early in those discussions, I think Simone was, had at least a sympathetic reading on that distinction. It's funny how here, though, later in the 60s, he, at least in its classical expression, as you might find in Merita, he kind of disavows that distinction, or at least the way it was employed, you know, two or three decades earlier. Although you're right, he continues later in the book to employ it in such a way, but as to bring the two together, you know, that we can't, on the one hand, as some earlier personalists wanted to do, ascribe man's social nature, especially in connection to the family and to the city, simply to his material individuality. And that in his spiritual personality, he transcends those communities. Simone, I think, is a little more balanced there that's saying that, yeah, there is this kind of material individuality, there is this spiritual personality, but the two are more united within the human individual than, than maybe earlier personalist articulation would have allowed. And so that we do find, even in our highest spiritual selves, a certain perfection and flourishing within the communities that we materially constitute, the family, the city. John Paul II was, was great on this. In his early philosophical writings, you know, he presented himself as a, as a personalist thinker in the mold of, of earlier 20th century personalist writers, although he was very strong on this point and distinguished himself on this matter. You know, in terms of, yes, he says there is a certain sense in which the I encounters a thou, and it's in the I-thou relationship you know, two persons relating to each other that you discover a sense of the self and the subject really emerges. John Paul II, Wartiwa said that that doesn't really complete itself. That process doesn't complete itself until you move past the I and thou and enter what he calls the we community. 
so that there are more than just two people involved. It's a, it's a we, and that we have our own good together, and that we work together for this good. And it's within this we of a community, this we of the family, this we of the city that I, as a spiritual subject, find my identity and that, that I flourish. So I think Simone is, in this later work, is, is much more in tune with what, you know, Wojtyla at the same time, but in Poland is, is working out himself, that this distinction between the individual and the person, whereas in some ways legitimate, shouldn't be so distinct that they become separated and be seen as, as opposed to each other, as I think you see in some earlier expressions of personalism. So reading that again, I was really interested to see, because I'd forgotten about that piece in the work. But it's important to see that Simone's treatment of the personal and the individual there has a certain history to it and manifests in a general theory of authority, you know, Simone's own kind of maturation in that, that point of the theory. He says that the individual per se can be just a member of a species or of a group, but mm -hmm. that a person, because it is a, I think, a complete substance, is that the phrase? That's right. Yeah. It is a person is a kind of a universe to itself. So right. it may be a part and it is certainly oriented towards being a part, but it can never be only a part. In fact, right. I suppose you could say, I had the thought and, and tell me what you think of this. When reading this, the second time I read the book, I had the thought that because he's talking about how no community is sort of perfectly complete. Right. I had the thought that the church would be the only exception to that because the church itself is a person. Well, <laughs> I would say it's a person, uh, metaphorically, perhaps speaking, because it, it is a society of persons, members of the body of Christ, yes. But even there, I mean, the body, there is a kind of a metaphorical image that doesn't get rid of the fact that we relate to each other still as, as persons within a community. The analogy has to kind of work all the way across, right? It's, it's the, also the way in which, you know, I'm a part of my own family and also a part of the city of, of Washington, D.C. currently. And in fact, you know, somebody like Deconic is quite clear in explaining, I mean, that's kind of how, you know, we, we talk about the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem, how we all, you know, it's the communion of saints in heaven that functions according to the same kind of political reality as we, as we find here on earth. You know, that the common good of the heavenly city is, is Christ, is God. And that, you know, we all love that good together. And we all work towards, in a sense, adoring and worshiping that good together, much in the same way as that, you know, you find the kind of the common activity coordinated, you know, in families and cities today. Yeah, that gets into a bigger discussion just as to parts and holes. You know, this was a very great sticking point for, for Maritain dealing with the tradition. He didn't like a whole lot of discussion about persons as parts of greater holes, person as a part of a family, as a part of the city. Because there's a view of part there, which is wrong. It's not like we've become like pistons in an engine, you know, where we just kind of serve kind of one function, whereas outside of that whole, we would have no identity and no function. Persons belong to societies, persons belong to holes in a very particular way, you know, as a person, so that, you know, I don't become like a heart or a rib in a body, but no, I'm, I'm a person within a society. And that has its own kind of reality and distinction. I mean, the way Aristotle, the way Aquinas treated that was that, you know, if, if a body itself, like a human body made up of parts, organs, bones, flesh, if that's a substantial whole, whereas the part finds its identity and function only within the whole, societies are different. Those are holes, but holes of order, they said, whereas the parts come together and they function together, but each part retains its own identity and activity apart from the whole. So, whether I'm at home or out, you know, in the desert, you know, I'm still myself. I can still perform basic functions. And it's because no society that I belong to, the family, the city, even the church here on earth is perfect in and of itself. I can move in and out of different societies as I have different kinds of needs met. But all of that is going to be the family, the city, the church here is all going to find its, its completion in you know the new heavens the new earth in heaven and in the communion of saints whereas you know in the one society of heaven i'll finally find my perfect place and, and have every need met and every every desire you know satisfied well that's a, a beautiful place to wrap up i would like to just mention one last point to 
sort of i mean you've 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 wrapped it up beautifully in terms of our end mm-hmm. but in terms of the sort of the concepts of authority and autonomy i i really loved how he put it that you know a lot of people think of hierarchy as being just a result of authority but it's not mm-hmm. it's actually a combination or sort of the tension and combination between the principle of authority and the principle of autonomy which you could also right. I suppose calls subsidiarity right. in a sense. And that's a beautiful way of looking at it because hierarchy is the kind of this like dirty word now as well right. because people associate it with authority. And of course of course it is, but if all there was was authority, there would be no hierarchy. It right. would be one level of authority and everybody else would be, you know, crushed by it, which is sort of the situation you get where you know, people talk about the loss of the inter- intermediary institutions in modern society. That's that's sort of what you right. get when it's just the state and the ind- the individual. Right. No, and it's it's a recognition, and and I think that that highlights also again just one of the the aspects of how authority is limited by autonomy. The limitation of authority itself creates the need for multiple authorities, and those multiple authorities are related one to another according to you know, their own function and the good to which they point so that even the, even the authorities themselves are hierarchically organized, you know, one to another, you know, that the father of the family has his place, the mayor of a city has his place, the priest in the parish has his place, the bishop, you know, in the diocese has his place, the governor has his place. So you have all of these, because of legitimate autonomy, putting limits on certain forms of authority, you have the kind of the multiplication of authorities, then which are all hierarchically, you know, organized one to another. So I think that's, that's something of what, what Simone is, is getting to here. So that, yeah, that the legitimate limitation of authority kind of complexifies <laughs> authority. But each that might kind of alarm us to say, wow, we just have more authority. Well, no, because each authority is limited to its own kind of sphere of activity, its own sphere of organization and governance, and, and actually makes authority less odious, you know, to us. <laughs> because, you know, I don't have to go to the president of the United States to get my driver's license, for example. You know, there are, <laughs> there are other, other authorities, lesser authorities for me to deal with to do that. And thank God the president of the United States isn't in charge of you know, handing out driver's licenses. He's, he's got bigger things to worry about. Okay. So I, I think we should probably go ahead and wrap up. Father Aquinas, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time, not only to have this conversation, but also to, you know, revisit the book in preparation for it. I, yeah. I really appreciate it. That was very generous of you. No, it's my pleasure. And I just encourage your listeners to pick up a copy and read it. It's, it's, it's worth I the sure time would, yeah. and, and the effort putting into just becoming familiar with with the concepts involved, it'll certainly increase anyone's ability to engage in these these kinds of conversations. Yeah, it's something everyone should pick up and read. Next week's episode will be an interview with the poet James Matthew Wilson. I'm going to do a few episodes with him coming up, actually. In this first one, we'll be especially talking about his new poetry cycle, The River of the Immaculate Conception. It is a beautiful piece of work inspired by the recent Mass of the Americas, which you may have heard about. It was recently celebrated in Washington, D.C., and it is a poetry cycle spanning a lot of the history of Catholicism in North America, from Our Lady of Guadalupe to St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. And uh, I'm sure that he'll be reading some pieces from that for us as well. So that's going to be a really fun conversation. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. God bless you all. And I'll see you next week. Bye.